Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sergio Lopez. I'm a software engineer uh, in the virtualization team at Red Hat. And we're going to talk a bit about lightweight VMs for serverless and containers. So to be able to talk about uh, lightweight VMs, we, need to, we first need to define what is a lightweight VM and in which way they are different from other kinds of VMs, which lead us to the first question, which is how can we classify virtual machines? There are, of course, many answers to this question, but we are going to focus mainly on three aspects. Uh, the first one is the guest operating system that is going to be running inside the VM. Um, we don't really care about the guest operating system in a general sense, so we, don't, we are not going to be talking about uh, Windows VMs against Linux VMs against wherever VMs, but we don't really care about the limitations that the guest imposes on the VM. So whether we need to support hardware quicks or we need to emulate certain kind of legacy devices, because in virtualization compatibility is a big burden for the development. So the best scenario is when you have a fully customizable operating system where you can build from source, uh, change in whatever way you want, and the worst, of course, is when you have to, be, uh, to run a legacy, binary-only, proprietary operating system. We are also going to care about the physical resources that a virtual machine requires, because the number of vCPUs may have an impact on how we present them to the VM. Uh, depending on the architecture, we may need to emulate one kind of specialized device or the other. The amount of RAM that also makes the virtual machine monitor overhead less or more relevant. Uh, so if, for example, I'm running a 32 gigabyte uh, virtual machine, and my virtual machine monitor requires an additional gigabyte of RAM for its own purposes, well, it's not such a big deal. It's 32 gigabytes against one. But if I plan to run many small VMs, uh, which one gigabyte or two gigabytes of RAM, if my monitor still requires an additional gigabyte of RAM, well, and then I have a problem. For those not familiar with the terminology, a uh, virtual machine monitor is the software that implements the user space side of the hypervisor. So for KVM, we have multiple VMs like QMU, KVM Tall, CrossVM, Firecracker, Cloud Hypervisor, and many more. Um, as it's also important to determine whether we, we need to implement virtual NUMA, so we do, if we do expect to learn, run large VMs that are potentially larger than a single NUMA node in the host, we are going to need to implement uh, virtual NUMAs to be able to partition the guest in multiple uh, nodes so to avoid uh, cross-node accesses. And also, pass-through devices may require special treatment. Uh, the final aspect we are going to care about is the size life cycle of the VM itself. Uh, do we need the VM to oblige the host? If so, we are going to need some kind of flight migration me uh, mechanisms, perhaps potentially also stress migration. And if the VM is uh, going to be persistent, we are going to care more about the block larger requirements. We probably are going to need a snapshot for, having, uh, for being able to easily do backups. We are going to need bitmaps, sparse files for theme provisioning, and probably linked images. So with, uh, once we clarify those aspects, let's define uh, what uh, traditional machines are. Uh, in a general sense, traditional virtualization was driven by the needs of the users at the time, which totally makes sense which mainly were consolidating services, supporting legacy systems on newer hardware, and improving the availability of the services to tolerate hardware issues. Those needs translate into requirements such as supporting legacy operating systems, as we said before, with uh, hardware queries and potentially legacy devices, implementing features to support high availability strategies, like migration, for example, supporting potentially large VMs, which implies uh, having to support Vinuma and potentially specialized devices depending on architecture, and prioritizing reliability, flexibility, and management over performance in the block layer. A good example of this last point is that it's a well-known fact that raw images have better performance than feature-rich images like QQ2, but in fact, most users are actually using feature-rich images because they are willing to sacrifice that performance in exchange for so that's those new features that those images provide. So now that we talk about traditional VMs, uh, what's different uh, within them and like with VMs? So like with virtualization is driven, ma driven mainly by one uh, need, which is strong isolation. There are different use cases. There may be secondary goals, but the main one is strong isolation, which means that the traditional set of uh, requirements is obsolete. Uh, the guest OS is assumed to be fully customized. In fact, in all use cases we are going to explore here, it can be completely altered in any way, so we don't need to support legacy operating systems. 
Uh, usually they are short lived, so no need for late migration, no need to oblige the host. Uh, they are expected to be small, which means we don't need to support things like Binuma, but on the other hand, uh, footprint of the virtual machine monitor becomes very important. And they are usually ephemeral, which means that we probably not did so many features in the block layer. Okay, so now that we have defined uh, that that will be virtual machines have different needs that traditional virtual machines, which translates into different requirements, we're going to see how some virtual machine monitors has, have evolved to fulfill better those requirements. And we're going to do that by looking through some use cases for like VBMs. Uh, the first use case is microservices and functional and services, which technically are two different use cases, but share most of the requirements, which are running lots of almost identical small VMs, which implies that the virtual machine monitor has, must have a very small footprint. It also implies that we, another requirement is that we need to get to user space as, as quick as possible, which basically means booting very fast. And as an example of this uh, kind of use case, we have AWS Lambda, which is very interesting because it's basically running lots of, of VMs using Firecracker. And inside of those VMs, you have a minimalist Linux kernel, you have a, a minimalist root file system, and then you have the uh, uh, customer provide binary implementing the, micro, uh, the microservice inside that VM. That, and that's basically, you have also so network endpoints and an API for discovery of some network endpoints, but that's basically it's quite simple. And that's why I think that Lambda is not only a good example of the use case, but it's also a good example of uh, quite pragmatic engineering. Uh, another example is the unikernel-based microservices, which this was kind of a trend like two years ago, then it faded away, and then it's making a comeback, or at least I think it's making a comeback because I was asking people here around DEFCOM and I was the only one with that impression. So maybe it's just me, then maybe I confusion my desires with the reality again. And uh, an example of unikernel-based microservices, um, uh, the good thing about that is that it goes one step forward of containers. So basically the high overview idea is that you are linking your application, not only statically linking your application, not only against the uh, dynamic libraries, but also with the kernel, uh, resulting in a, a static image that provides everything. So you get the lowest possible footprint. So you just throw that into a, a VM and it's uh, sufficient. Uh, and as an example of specialized virtual machine monitors for this use case, we have Firecracker. And QMU with the introduction of the recent, uh, with the recent introduction of the micro VM machine type. Um, let's uh, see some highlights of Firecracker. Firecracker is written in Rust and based on Cross VM, which is the Chromium OS virtual machine monitor. This is kind of interesting because Cross VM is an intended to for this kind of use case. Uh, in fact, as far as I know, they are simply using it for running a single VM inside Chrome OS to run Linux applications. I don't know why they needed to write a VMM just for that, but that's the thing. Uh, Firecracker builds into a static binary, which is uh, nice because it allows you to do things like uh, statically analyze the binary, see what kind of thing syscalls can potentially do, and then create a very precise second filter for the binary, which is kind of cool. It implements a minimalist machine type. So for example, it doesn't implement ACPI, and instead of PCI, it implements MMIO has transport. And this is times, obviously, to the fact that it doesn't need to be compatible with uh, legacy operating systems. But that also has some drawbacks, and the main one is the lack of hot plug support. Uh, it needs a customized button patch Linux kernel image, which means that you can take a uh, pre built kernel image from uh, a distribution and boot it in Firecracker. But on the other hand, you don't need to patch the uh, Linux kernel source code, you just need a special configuration. And the advantages for this use case is that you have a smaller code base, which is easier to maintain now did. You have a smaller binary, you have a reduced footprint, and the guest operating boosts fast thanks to the minimalist machine type. I want to put emphasis on this last point because when Firecracker was in Italy announced, uh, people on Hacker News and Lobster and whatever uh, were um, assuming that uh, it, the guest operating system booted fast because some kind of magical optimization in the BMM in Firecracker, which is not the case. So what's happened here is that you are presenting less devices to the guest operating system, and you are presenting devices that are easier uh, to configure. So it boots faster. Um, other example of specialized VMM for this use case is the micro VM machine type for QMU. 
uh, which, as I said, is it implemented has a new uh, QME matching type. Uh, QME can be built only with microVM support for to obtain a smaller binary, to link with fewer uh, dynamic uh, libraries, and have lower startup times. It's heavily inspired by Firecracker and basically didn't implement the same matching time with small differences. As, you, as a result, it also lacks plug support and it also needs a customized button patch kernel image. The advantages for this use case is that the guests boot fast, again, thanks to the minimalist matching type. I have some numbers for this, uh, for this VMM, uh, for, which basically are for entry, it boots for entry point to user space on a VM with a bit on the device and a bit diode block device in roughly 60 milliseconds on Linux and uh, 3 milliseconds for OSB, which is a, a, a unikernel. And it has a smaller footprint than other matching types of chemo, which is nice. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, Firecracker versus QEMU, microVM. QEMU versus uh, Firecracker. Which one is better? By the guy who wrote the QEMU microVM machine type. <laughs> so I'm totally impartial. Um, so we've seen that uh, there are different aspects of both VMMs. We've seen that there are also some similarities. So I put the, pro the pros and the cons on a spread set. I ran some, uh, uh, some complex algorithm on the spread set. And uh, I got the conclusion that the, the best one is the one that fits your better your use case, obviously. Um, so in general, Firecracker is expected to have a lower footprint. But QME, on the other hand, provides you most features and usually a better I.O. performance. But this depends on a large number of, thing, of factors, so uh, the case operating system, your kind of workload, your host. So the best thing you can do is if you are considering uh, this use case, uh, uh, try both, evaluate the pros and cons, see which one was better for you. And the important takeaway here is that now we have more VMS than ever. We can learn to use one, one from each other, and we can improve the KVM ecosystems, and liberate the world from those pesky closed source uh, hypervisors, which is the goal in the end. Um, and with this, we go to the second use case, which is additional isolation for containers. Uh, the requirements are basically being able to run lots of different small to mid-sized VMs. Uh, we also need to support hot look uh, for growing up the VMs. This is because in Kubernetes terminology, um, each VM doesn't hold like a single container but a pod. And a pod can be uh, composed by one or more containers. So uh, the way we, in which this works is basically uh, when you create the first container, the VM is created uh, only with the requirements of that particular container. And when a second container is going to root on the same VM, uh, this VM is expanded by adding, by the hub plugging uh, vCPUs and VRAM. Um, that's the reason why you need hot plug. The main example is obviously Kata containers. And as a specialist VMMs, we can count QMU after incorporating the NEMU and QMU lead improvements. We see something about this in a minute. And Cloud Hypervisor, uh, which is still in early stages. Um, what's uh, what's the, this thing about QMU, NEMU, and QMU lead? So basically, Intel ran to friendly QMU force for experimenting with features they needed, uh, which were mainly faster boot time and a lower footprint. Uh, as of today, those improvements have, uh, has been uh, merged into mainline QMU, so uh, NEMU and QMU lead and maintenance mode. mode. Um, QMU is now the preferred VMM for running kata containers, uh, once again. And uh, this is uh, an example of how QMU has evolved uh, through friendly force to better suit this use case. Uh, the second VMM we are going to talk about is uh, Cloud Hypervisor, which is a experimental VMM sponsored by Intel for this particular use case. It's also written in Rust. It's based on Rust VMM, which is an umbrella project for holding crates, uh, implementing fun functionality required by uh, Rust-based VMMs. So it's basically a way for Firecracker, Cloud Hypervisor, and potentially other Rust VMMs to share code and avoid duplicating efforts. It emulates a malchine similar to the one emulated by Firecracker and QMU and MicroVM, but with a device model that includes ACPI and PCI to support hot plug. Uh, with that exception, it also needs to be uh, small and link into a static uh, and statically binary. Um, before going to the next use case, I want to uh, pause for a minute to talk a bit about hot plug, but uh, if you remember, we highlighted that Firecracker doesn't support hot plug, uh, QMU and MicroVM doesn't support um, hot plug support either. Um, 
Cloud hypervisor was modified on purpose to support hot plug support. Hot, what's happening here? So the thing is that nowadays hot plug support is implemented uh, after the way in which you will be doing on a physical machine. So if you are virtualizing on an x86, you need to do the same things you will do on a, on a physical x86 machine, which is not something as straightforward as it could be, because that makes sense when you are dealing with physical hardware, but it doesn't make as much sense when you are dealing with a virtualized machine. So it's technically possible to implement a specific for, uh, hot plug model for virtual machines uh, that would allow to simplify the process and play many optimization tricks. An example of this is with IOMM, which is still on early stages. Um, but there is an opposition as it would mean duplicating an existing working future. Uh, it requires change on both the BMS and the guest kernels, uh, but well, it seems that there are more arguments in favor of doing that, so perhaps it's something that is worth a try. And uh, that will give us hot plug support in both Firecracker and MicroVM, and create more MicroVM without ACPI and PCI. At this point, some of you may be wondering why ACPI and PCI are a problem for MicroVMs, and we prefer not to implement them. Uh, the main reason is that all, both ACPI and PCI are very complex for good reasons when you are dealing with physical hardware. But those reasons are not that strong when you are running virtualized machines. So that complexity translates into a larger code base to support those devices, which also translates into a, 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 a more cost in the boot time. So the legacy like operating system takes more time for booting. Um, so that's the reason which it will be preferred to not implement those devices on micro VMs. And the last use case uh, is implementing a trusted execution environment in a VM. Uh, this one, uh, the requirements basically are running VMs on, with hardware-assisted memory encrypted, like uh, AMD SEB, uh, provide remote attestation for the contents inside the VM, uh, provide a functionality similar to the one provided by Intel SGX. The, exam the main example is Enar, which is still in early stages. Um, I'm not going to enter much into details about how uh, uh, TE works, because it's very complex, and there was a talk, a talk about this yesterday. But I think it was nice to talk about NRS a bit in this presentation to illustrate mainly how things can, how different can things be when you don't need to support legacy operating system and you have full control of both the VMM and whatever is running inside the VM. So for example, in the case of NRS inside the VM, there will be a micro or unique kernel, it's still to be defined. There will be a WebAssembly JIT, there will be a WebAssembly Cisco interface based program. And instead of emulating devices, which is kind of interesting, uh, NS will implement a, a mechanism for the kernel to request Cisco. So uh, if you need network access, instead of uh, providing a built Ionet device, uh, which will give you a network interface in the guest, uh, what NS will provide is a mechanism for the kernel to request opening a connection to some f f uh, host on IP, uh, to read from the socket, write to the socket, pull the socket, whatever. Uh, the syscas will be parsed by the VMM and served in part by the VMM and, the, and in part by the host through the VMM. And as I say, it shows how, it shows how different things can be. Uh, conclusions. VMs are cool again. Woo. Uh, to be honest, uh, traditional virtualization was becoming a bit boring um, uh, for uh, good reasons because it's a mature technology, which means that we have products that are more stable, which is great. It makes customers happy, that's cool. But from an engineering point of view, uh, it's kind of a bit boring for, because there are no breakthroughs. Uh, evolution is, is slow and incremental. Um, so the fun thing is that we've seen that breaking the ties with the compatibility, with uh, live migration, breaking ties with uh, the storage requirements, opens a world of possibilities. We've seen that in the serverless and container spaces, lightweight VMs will play a significant role, providing additional isolation. Uh, we know for a fact that in the public cloud, lightweight VMs will be essential for hardware-assisted uh, and remotely attested memory encryption, which is very complex, but it's basically the only, the best way we have right now to uh, uh, ensure that your data is not accessible by anyone, not even the cloud provider. And with all, things, all these things in mind, let's work on improving the uh, lightweight VM landscape. Let's find new use case, let's evolve and create new VMMs, 
do weird things that were impossible when you are tied with the compatibility, and in general, have fun. So that's all I have to share. I have to. I hope you enjoy it, and thank you. Any questions? Sorry, I can hear you. Uh, so the question is, the best way to initiate a shutdown is to generate a triple fault from the guest. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. How, how so uh, the best thing to do is the, uh, basically, uh, is, this is going a bit into detail, but basically what you do is overwrite uh, the interruption vector, and then generate a page fault that will go into the interruption vector, generate another page fault, and then you have the triple page fault, and you shut down. Right, You're welcome. Any more questions? Well, it's technically not hard by itself, but it means implementing support for a new yeah, thing. Yeah, but Ingham doesn't do anything for NUMA. You basically provide guests the technology and it's on its own. It's not like a CPI when you need tons of stuff, right? It was just an example of uh, how uh, Firecracker or other uh, cloud hypervisors can uh, give up removing functionality and uh, still works. So it's, uh, it's not uh, throw through all. So they are, we, could main, uh, we could name many features that uh, all the hypervisors don't need at create mode does needs. Uh, it was just an example. Now, it's, it's, you're right. It's not a good point. It's not really that hard to implement. It's just another thing you need to implement. Yeah, you mentioned plug and unplug, but how about the device assignment, like direct uh, DMA from the hardware So the question is about how do to do DMA to the devices. Uh, basically, uh, nothing, nothing changes there. You have IO, MMU in the same way. You can implement it uh, mostly in the same way. There is also an without, PCI. without PCI, you can do basically the same things. The, the, uh, the uh, main issue, uh, uh, which is outside the topic of the presentation, is about the out of the of the tree device driver, driver. So you can have device drivers outside the main process and communicate with them with some kind of protocol. But it's outside the uh, the presentation for, uh, for the next one, perhaps. Sorry, there was some noise and I could get. What kind of functionalities could be employed to additionally isolate the process that we currently don't? Without uh, the need to launch additional kernel management. Well, I'm not aware of many of them. Uh, you mean, the question is, is if there are. The question is about other uh, security extensions that will you use instead of running a. a well, I, I'm, I, don't know the, I don't know much about the details, but I know that Google's Gvisor tries to do something like that. So you, they can use Ptrace or they can use KVM. But in the end, they are basically running a very small kernel inside the, uh, the VM. And it can also simulate that there is no operating system, but well, there is an operating system for a fact, just a very small one. Any more questions? Now we're out of time. Finish. Thank you.